Welcome, everyone. The presentation is about to begin. Um, this session will be recorded and will last 60 minutes. Uh, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation and turn off your cameras. That helps with the bandwidth. If you have a question or comment, enter it in the chat, which is at the bottom of Zoom at the bar at the bottom. Um, and your question will be addressed by the presenter at the end. If you are on a phone, you will be given an opportunity during the Q&A time at the end to voice your questions and comments. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within a week after this live event and post it to the TSO YouTube channel. So TSO International Association's Applied Linguistics Intersection is pleased to present this webinar titled Teacher Identity, Awareness, and Critical Autoethnography. Our speakers are Kristen Lindahl and Bedretan Yezan. We're very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar. My name is Bahie Hardaker and my colleague Polina Vinogradova and I will be mod your moderator for today's event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Kristen Lindahl. Great, thank you so much, Mahi and uh, Paulina for having us here with you today. We are um, so excited to be able to share a little bit of our work and also collaborate with all the amazing TESOL professionals here uh, from across the world. It's always so amazing, I think, to see all the locations that everybody is joining us uh, from. So welcome, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. As you mentioned, our topic is on language teacher identity awareness and critical autoethnography. And uh, obviously, all three of those topics are very large and probably too too large to do adequate justice to in only 60 minutes, but we will try our best. Uh, we would love for you to put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, I know our colleagues in the Applied Linguistics Intersection will um, help us moderate those, and so um, when we have some times to pause during the presentation, uh, we will address those um, as we can. So with that, we will get started. Um, I am a professor of TESOL and Applied Linguistics at the University of Texas, San Antonio. So hello from South Texas. And um, like I said, it's great, great to be with you all today. Um, so our sort of larger essential question that uh, informs both this webinar and a lot of the collaboration that Dr. Yazan and I have done over the last couple of years has to do with how can identity-oriented approaches inform language teacher education pedagogy? So we know that uh, there is a very extensive research on language teacher identity uh, as a research framework, but uh, in terms of our own approaches to pedagogy, we wanted to know how can these identity-oriented lenses inform what we do in teacher education classrooms? So um, an overview of our webinar today, first we'll provide um, sort of a summary of the research background uh, via 10 arguments about language teacher identity work in the research space. And then I will discuss some current research that I've done via some empirical mixed method studies on identity and language awareness and then how ultimately they connected me to incorporating these, uh, these activities into teacher pedagogy. And then uh, Bedretton will follow up with connections to critical autoethnography and share with you some of the ways that he has implemented uh, that method, as well as some of the challenges and lessons that he feels he's learned via implementing uh, that in his own courses. And then we'll end with some questions and comments. So moving along, as I mentioned, uh, both of us have been engaged in a some of the scholarship on identity and pedagogy. And as specifically with our own co-editing activities, uh, first I wanted to mention our TESOL journal, Special Issue 2019, which if you are a TESOL member, that is actually a member benefit that you have uh, access to that online journal. So in our special issue from 2019, which is volume 10, issue four, uh, it's entitled An Identity-Oriented Lens to Teachers' Lives. And so really our proposal in this special issue was uh, not 
to replicate the identity research work that had already been conducted via other special issues in journals such as Modern Language Journal and TESOL Quarterly. But we really wanted to seek and um, amplify articles that showed how identity-oriented approaches could be implemented to pedagogy. And so this special issue really focuses on how, um, you know, identity in all of its, like, you know, mul multiplicitous complexities <laughs> really contributes to the way that teachers um, enact and embed their identities in their classroom situations, whatever um, that kind of educational context may look like. Another uh, place that you will see some of the scholarship on identity and pedagogy was actually included in the TESOL Journal and TESOL Quarterly special joint issue um, from summer 2020 on race identity and English language teaching. And I mention it because two of the articles from our special issue were highlighted again in this special joint issue uh, via the work of Dr. Charles and Dr. Zacharias, who um, discuss their identity backgrounds um, related to um, race and identity and then how those are again you know enacted in the English language teaching context so I wanted to amplify those voices again and then our third project um, well the second one wasn't our project but I wanted to amplify the contributing authors uh, but the first one and then this one are our projects um, the um, Rutledge edited volume is, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click on it, <laughs> is um, Language Teacher Identity in TESOL, and it's Teacher Education and Practice as Identity Work. And so in this volume, uh, Bed Retton and I really tried to extend the amount of um, voices we uh, were able to engage with as colleagues because the TESOL TESOL Journal special issue uh, had such a warm reception. There were so many people who contributed to it that actually we extended the work into creating an uh, edited volume. And so in the volume, um, you'll see approaches to teacher identity work in narratives and writing, um, work in multimodal spaces, which is very salient now that so many of us are online. Um, identity work vis-a-vis -vis race, ethnicity, and language, um, teacher education, and then teacher educator research practices, which is some of what we'll also talk about today. So uh, the topics that you'll hear about today stem from uh, the work contained herein in these volumes. And I wasn't sure if this would be recorded or if slides would be shared, but if slides are shared, um, those uh, compilations are hyperlinked for your access, or we could probably drop the links in the chat too. So um, with regard to language teacher identity, there are um, 10 sort of, I guess, summary statements from the existing research on language teacher identity that we highlight in the introduction to our book. And so I will show the first five of those and then Bed Retton will share the next five with you. And um, so first, uh, we acknowledge that language teacher identity involves teachers' engagement in identity work, meaning that um, it's not enough to just research teachers' identity, but they themselves uh, must engage in it. Um, we also acknowledge language teacher identity as being continual, as teachers repeatedly negotiate and enact identity, meaning identity is dynamic and not static, and is continually negotiated and renegotiated over the course of uh, the educator's career. Also, language teacher identity is influenced by significant experiences that are gained by multi-membership in communities of practice. So all of us belong to multiple communities of practice, all of which influence our identity uh, via the experiences that we gain in those communities of practice. Also, language teacher identity is key to the transition from student to teacher, wherein candidates, so teacher candidates, are introduced to the imagined communities of practice to which they feel belonging or seek membership. So from a teacher educator perspective, uh, we really were interested in this particular point of the shift from how do professionals transition from 
seeing themselves more as students to seeing themselves more as teachers? And then how do they um, seek belonging or membership in communities of practice as professionals? Uh, we also acknowledge that I, language teacher identity is both individually led, so of course it's very based in the individual, but it's also contextually mediated and or constrained. So a lot depends as well, not only on the individual, but the context in which they find themselves and their work occurring. So um, for the next slide, I will mute myself and um, Bed Retton, I will turn it over to you. Hello everyone, uh, welcome again. Uh, so here I'm gonna continue with the sixth argument that we made based on the research. Uh, the first one is here in my slide, identity work or teacher identity involves an ongoing engagement with narrative, which you know is a huge part in our lives that we you know, narrate and re-narrate our past experiences. And as we do that, we imagine and reimagine for ourselves certain uh, future uh, futures or aspirations. And the next one is uh, language teacher identity is actually inseparable from other social identities relative to race, ethnicity, culture, gender, sexual orientation, class, nationality, religion, faith, and community membership. So whenever we uh, study language teacher identity, we should definitely consider what other social identities are inter uh, secting or intertwined with uh, language teacher identity, you know, perhaps the professional and social identities together. And next uh, is uh, that language teacher identity is emotionally charged. Uh, whenever we uh, respond emotionally to the incidents that we have in our teaching life or professional lives, we are actually negotiating a certain identity. And whenever uh, we, uh, and, and and on the other side, our identity negotiation always uh, involves uh, emotional engagement uh, in a negative or positive ways. And uh, the other uh, argument that we want to make here is that language teacher identity orients uh, professional agency and commitment or investment. Uh, we uh, choose to uh, channel our energy into certain uh, practices because of our identity. And as we do that, as we assert agency and commit our energy and uh, efforts to certain practices, we at the same time negotiate our identities. And the last one is uh, teacher identity consists of continuous attempts to mediate and negotiate contradictory sources of identity that uh, I think we purposefully left this for, th for the last uh, argument because you know identity is contradictory that we need to accept at the very beginning uh, for our own identities as teacher educators and researchers, but also for our uh, teacher candidates identities and, and the you know, identities of teachers that we're working with, uh, we are going to come across a lot of contradiction, which would lead to some tension uh, or dilemmas and conflicts, but also uh, is really related to emotions as well. And I'm going to mute myself here and let Kristen continue. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, the 10 arguments that we just made in our uh, previous two slides are um, actually highlighted, as I mentioned, in the introduction to our book and are, um, you know, heavily referenced in the extant language teacher identity literature. So if you are looking for references on any of these 10 arguments, uh, you can find those there. I just wanted to be sure you knew that. Um, so uh, now I'm going to dive into a little bit of discussion about my own research and a little bit of the trajectory in terms of uh, the work around identity awareness and actual language ideologies um, in which I've been engaged for the last couple of years and how uh, that led me to looking at identity in terms of um, more of a pedagogical approach in addition to a research frame. And um, a lot of my early work centered on uh, the idea of teacher language awareness, which uh, Stephen Andrews has talked a lot about. Uh, he actually has a book entitled Teacher Language Awareness. It came out around 2007. And so a lot of the work I did in my doctoral program and as an early career scholar centered on um, why, how, and when did teachers become aware of different aspects of language? Uh, but then over time, I think that approach has really evolved into how does teacher identity 
influence um, you know, how they become aware, aware of language, what they notice about language, and then in turn, uh, how does that operationalize itself into their own pedagogical practices in the classroom. So today, um, I'm going to highlight three recent mixed method studies that um, I've done in the last two years that center around these notions. And um, I'll talk a little bit about them. So uh, the first one that I wanted to mention um, stems from an investigation that I did with my colleague, uh, Katie Henderson, about the relationship between language ideologies, which are, you know, circulating ideologies, usually in larger discourse, but it could be a discourse in a community, a society, sometimes it's a school or a district uh, that centers on you know, beliefs and values about language, and then the way those can be enacted uh, in both pedagogical practice or discourse around students. And so one thing we were curious about was if there was a relationship between language ideologies and language awareness. And we looked at uh, teachers working in dual language immersion programs to see if there was a relationship. And actually one thing we found was that um, the more via, this is via um, some survey based um, questions, language analysis tasks, and then classroom observations and interviews. And one of our key findings was that uh, the more teachers uh, in this dual language immersion program were quote unquote aware of language in the ways that we operationalize it in this article, actually the more additive or pluralist their language ideologies um, manifested in a further analysis of the data that they provided. So that was a really interesting finding for us to note that um, maybe this kind of language awareness as it's oper operationalized in TLA might impact um, how pluralist or deficit oriented teachers were with regard to um, language use in their dual language program, as well as the way they would talk about students uh, in the dual language program. So um, a second article that uh, recently came out that was a study in uh, related to teacher language awareness in content and language integrated learning was um, had to do with what I'm terming macro identities in this case. And so in the teacher language awareness literature, there are three identities that um, Wright and Edge and Bolitho have re referred to a few different times. And they are uh, that first the user identity, which refers to how people use language as a speaker of that language. Uh, the second identity is that being able to analyze language. So there's an identity that as language teachers we all have in being able to analyze or sort of step outside of our use of language and be able to analyze maybe how or why people are using language the way they are. Often this is operationalized as metalinguistic awareness. Uh, but in terms of a classroom or a formal education context, it can be, you know, teachers' ability to answer questions about language, ability to identify maybe breakdown in communication or meaning, or able to identify, uh, even in terms of sociolinguistics, maybe how people uh, use language for sense of identity development and belonging, et cetera. So there's a lot of analytical ability involved in teacher language awareness, or I should say analytical activity, not necessarily ability. And then the third sort of macro identity in the earlier teacher language awareness literature had to do with your identity as a teacher. And so the idea was that, or is that professionals with um, developed teacher language awareness sort of have intersectional identity as users of language, as analysts of language, and as teachers of language. And so when I looked at these three sort of macro identities in a content and language integrated learning text, and the educators who worked therein. Um, again, ideologies came out related to, in particular, um, probably largely contextually mediated, as we mentioned before, but related to language standardization. So there were a lot of circulating ideologies about uh, notions of correctness, about uh, preference of certain varieties over others, and also about uh, language. And again, this was in a formal content-based school context, but uh, certain language being more academic than other types of language. And so again, this study was more exploratory and didn't 
necessarily implement identity approaches pedagogically, but it did lead me to that conclusion that uh, the findings from those two studies, and of course my own interest in reading um, over, you know, language awareness, identity, and ideological topics, really expressed to me a more pressing need for development of what um, Ophelia Garcia terms critical multilingual awareness, which is that uh, in addition to those sort of macro identities as users, teachers, and analysts, that uh, we also work to understand the socio-historical political context in which language development and language learning is enacted. And so in terms of critical multilingual awareness, um, I think it uh, also speaks to a need for linguistically responsive teacher education in that we need teacher education that's both meta-linguistic in nature, but also meta-ideological in nature. So not only are we giving teachers a chance in, during teacher education programs to explore, you know, these notions of not just how to be a teacher, but also how to analyze language and, of course, how to use language, right, all the multiple languages that we may speak, but also what are the socio-political historical contexts in which we're embedded, but also which influence uh, the ways in which we use, analyze, and teach language. And so um, in a study that I'm, uh, is actually under review and hopefully will be presented next year, so good vibes about that if you don't mind. Um, one thing we found when we did a, a larger study with about 50 um, multilingual teacher candidates here at the University of Texas at San Antonio was um, that really identities informed how candidates grapple with their ideological orientation toward their own language, learner language, as well as ideologies about language that are in circulation. And so we implemented um, three language identity oriented tasks in an ESL methods course. And the first one consisted of language portraits, which were like visual representations of students' linguistic repertoires. And all of the students in our study um, identified as um, there were multiple sort of language identities uh, involved because as many of you know, Texas is a highly multilingual context. So uh, the language portraits gave students a chance to visually represent their own linguistic repertoires and all the various ways that they use language. Um, the second task we incorporated into our methods class was a student um, utterance analysis that was similar to the study that I had done previously to see um, in terms of pre-service teachers rather than in-service teachers, how were they analyzing um, student utterances and then how, what was influencing the ways in which they analyzed those student utterances. And then the third task that we incorporated was a language ideology tree task, which again gave students a multimodal um, avenue for identifying in the tree, they had to talk about like what's a language ideology for example, um, an idea, a pluralist ideology might be like multiple languages should be welcomed in a classroom. And they would write that on the trunk of the tree. And then on the leaves would be sort of the, the societal results or implications of that ideology. So how might you see it in action? And then below they had to draw the roots. So what might be the roots of that type of ideology? So the three tasks I think enabled some multimodal engagement with uh, these three things as, in terms of expressing their identity um, and their linguistic repertoire, given, getting a chance to um, work with some imagined student language and student utterances, and then also exploring the way that language is in use in societal circulation. And so what we found was that implementing these identity-oriented tasks in our language teacher pedagogy really presented some opportunities for developing heightened ideological clarity among the teachers. So um, in addition to um, you know, teaching strategies and uh, a lot of the how-to with pedagogy, the argument that we make is um, impl the implementation of these identity-oriented tasks really gives teachers a chance as they are developing their professional identity 
to reflect on language ideologies, attitudes and beliefs that they might hold, and then recognize the implications of those as they move into the classroom. And so um, I've presented uh, some studies that deal with identity, I think, on some larger um, levels, kind of like a, a macro level, as I mentioned. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bedretton, who will talk about a method, uh, critical autoethnography, that really looks at identity on a very individual level. So you kind of get a balance of both um, approaches to that. So I will stop sharing my screen, Bedretton, and uh, you can share yours, and we will continue. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. I'm going to uh, continue with uh, the description and discussion of the uh, pedagogical tool that I used in my teacher education course uh, starting in 2018 spring semester. So I'm going to share how I uh, became to use this uh, activity or identity oriented activity I would call and provide a very brief description and I'm going to uh, discuss the challenges that I encountered and then lastly I'm going to talk about the lessons that I learned uh, implementing that uh, teacher education tool. Uh, the first uh, point I'm going to highlight here is that uh, when I started to think about using uh, critical autoethnographic narrative as an identity oriented teacher learning tool, I was actually uh, like retrospectively doing some reflection. I think I was trying to resolve my identity tension because uh, I was doing some research on teacher identity and I was reading uh, other scholars research and I realized that uh, every resource study ends with an implication that identity should be part of our teacher education practices. And reading that uh, and also uh, seeing that my research also has the same implication, I was asking myself as a teacher educator, am I doing that? So I think that tension between my identities uh, as a teacher educator and researcher, I wanted to somehow align uh, or see some consistency in my identity. So I thought I should uh, design uh, a teacher identity tool to use identity as a framework for teacher education practices. That was my goal to begin with when I started thinking about critical autoethnographic narrative. And I designed it as a program-wide uh, tool or program-wide uh, activity uh, in which students or teacher candidates start writing uh, a narrative at the beginning of their uh, teacher education program and they continue working on that specific uh, narrative as they take courses until the end of their uh, teacher education program is you know that's the ideal way we could implement but it's you know it's very idealistic too uh, like all faculty should be on the same page and incorporating that uh, like uh, program-wide endeavor in a teacher education program would be challenging, then I thought, why not, uh, you know, I, I use it in my classroom. But in the, in the uh, critical autoethnographic narrative, the idea was to understand or help our students and teacher candidates understand the interplay between ideologies and identities that, you know, we have uh, discovered and explored in the, in the research arena that we know uh, ideologies and identities are in an interplay that, you know, uh, broader ideologies in a context provide us certain identity options and we as individuals uh, negotiate and uh, assert our agency to uh, construct an identity that we want. Like we said earlier, it's individually uh, mediated, but also uh, constrained by the broader ideologies. Uh, I thought it should be critical because uh, through that narrative, I wanted my students to see how they can make the personal experience political, uh, like in uh, critical pedagogy, education is, uh, is a political endeavor. So I wanted my students to realize that in their own lives, how uh, their own identities are closely 
interrelated with the ideologies in their context, which also is about their practices for future uh, teaching uh, jobs. And then in this uh, specific activity, I was expecting them to narrate first their own stories, their experiences of uh, using learning and teaching languages in the past, and then bring them to their recent experiences. And at the same time, analyze those experiences to see the, uh, the way ideologies are uh, trying to shape our identities and the way we are pushing back to those I ideologies that, the, that interplay between ideologies and identities. Uh, then uh, to provide a very brief uh, description uh, about the way I used it uh, in my class, I incorporated like four installments. Uh, and it, after every installment, I provided them, you know, written feedback through Word document uh, comment boxes. And then we had one-on-one -on -one meetings and I had six students. I was really lucky and it was really uh, doable uh, to uh, work with every student, uh, meeting them four times across the semester just to talk about their progress in their critical autoethnographic narratives. And then I brought in some uh, in-class uh, data analysis activities. I, I, I was working on some of the research project and I, I just took some data and then we analyzed them in the classroom. And then I let them co-construct their own uh, rubric for this assignment. They, they paired up and they created a rubric and they gave me the rubrics and I, uh, I just put them together and constructed uh, an overarching rubric uh, for the class. And then at the end of the uh, semester, they presented their uh, assignment uh, to their peers. So the challenges, I, I had several challenges and they were all opportunities for me to learn more implementing uh, critical autoethnographic narrative. So it was my first time using an assignment in 2018 spring and I really wanted to pilot the, the program wide idea in my course. And I didn't know exactly what I was expecting uh, or what, I, what my students or how my students are going to respond to uh, my, you know, uh, activity, my new activity, because uh, it was uh, unconventional uh, as an activity, asking students to engage in uh, such, uh, you know, big scale narrative writing and using a methodology, a research methodology as a, as a teaching or teacher uh, education tool or a teacher learning tool. That was uh, that was my first time using it and it had a lot of uh, challenges because of that. I, need, I needed to spend a lot of time preparing, designing and uh, giving a lot of uh, feedback to my students. And I also had challenges to connect the uh, nature of the activity to the course content. The course was linguistics for classroom teachers. And although I, mean, I believe it's you know, easily relatable, I was uh, perhaps beating myself too much to like, you know, uh, try to connect it to the traditional sense of linguistics. But you know, at the end of the day, I thought this is uh, about language ideologies and it is, uh, it is relevant for my students to engage in some analysis of their experiences to understand how language uh, is a social practice. And as they engage in that practice, they also negotiate identities. Then uh, I also spent some time to make sure that uh, kind of convince my students uh, that autoethnography is a legitimate research methodology because again, autoethnography is, a, uh, is still an outlier in the general qualitative research. I'm not saying it's not accepted, it is accepted very well, but uh, considering uh, the nature of the methodology, you know, in the sense that the researcher becomes the researched, like researcher, uh, analyzing, you know, their self uh, or themselves situated in cultures that it, that was uh, very novel to my students and they needed some time to think about it. They needed some time to read uh, sample autoethnographies like dissertations or uh, master theses and published papers and chapters uh, that really helped them to understand autoethnography as a legitimate research methodology that they can use and analyze their own experiences and write one to, you know, further get published perhaps. And then uh, at some point I, I noticed that my students were not always sure about what stories they should sell, what stories were important to them and they would just uh, they would just come to me and ask and, you know, say that uh, they have a story that they really, uh, that they really 
uh, want to uh, tell or narrate, but they weren't sure if it was important enough to share in a, in a paper or if it was important enough to put in a research study. And whenever they said that, I said, yes, go ahead and then tell this story. Because if you are asking me that question, I believe that story is important to you and you should uh, tell that story and analyze that story in your autoethnography. And uh, the other uh, challenge that I have, uh, or I had in, in two uh, iterations, some teacher candidates didn't get to the most recent stories that, I mean, there could be different reasons for that. Some of them did. Some of them started uh, providing examples and bringing in some stories from experiences from their current or recent teaching experiences. But some uh, took a lot of time excavating their identities in their past, past experiences, learning, teaching, and using languages. They, uh, I don't know, maybe it was a time management issue. They spent a lot of time dealing with their prior experience, and maybe those experiences needed more time for them. It's, again, it's a very individual assignment, so I didn't uh, see that as a problem, but my main idealistic goal was to bring them to most recent experiences to see how they can uh, analyze their uh, current experiences, learning and learning to teach in the program. Again, which, um, you know, this tells me that perhaps autoethnographic narrative should be a program-wide goal rather than a, you know, very specific, uh, you know, course goal. Although, you know, it worked really well in my course too. And the other, perhaps, you know, one of the most important things about, you know, autoethnography is vulnerability. I, uh, as the uh, teacher educator and uh, perhaps autoethnography coach, you know, helping my students or facilitating their writing process, I needed to uh, show them that I, I am vulnerable. Like just, I share my stories. Uh, I, you know, I told them my stories before I let them tell their stories so that they, they feel comfortable to tell uh, their stories because all those stories or most of them included emotional uh, experiences as well. So, so I think uh, one of the key issues or key aspects of that was uh, us becoming vulnerable. This is, this is very prominent in autoethnography literature uh, because researcher opens up their world or their experiences, their emotions, their vulnerabilities for public scrutiny. That's uh, although like autoethnography seems to be an easy quote unquote uh, methodology, in reality, when it comes to writing one, it's really challenging and uh, very uh, emotionally charged as well. And the other experience that I had challenges with was providing feedback, uh, like not only when I was giving them feedback in the classroom, like uh, when we were discussing their progress, but also uh, giving them feedback in a written form uh, in the Word documents or, you know, comment boxes and then meeting them one on one. I wasn't sure uh, which one of my identities was most more prominent there. I, but at some point I got conscious about it and I wanted to uh, just make sure that I was a teacher educator first when I was giving my students feedback and a researcher next because uh, I had those moments when I needed to provide my uh, teacher candidates the, the feedback they needed to write a better autoethnography but also I was considering uh, so which one is more, uh, which one should be more prioritized like them uh, analyzing their stories and uh, understanding the relationship between their identities and the broader ideologies and become more critical of those ideologies or writing a good autoethnography like rhetorically and, and in compositionally. So they, they are actually, you know, very intertwined, but I was just having this challenge uh, of like perhaps again an identity tension there as, as a teacher, educator, and researcher. Then the other challenge was uh, selecting a theoretical framework or conceptual framework. I asked them to, uh, to uh, find uh, a conceptual framework. I provided them a lot of, a lot of resources. That was uh, perhaps the other challenge I had. I was trying to help them analyze their stories after they narrated them. Uh, that was challenging because the students didn't, not all of them had uh, research uh, training before. So that course, like me uh, implementing that uh, activity also included a lot of uh, uh, training, a lot of scaffolding, a lot of mentoring in terms of like how to do, uh, how to select and construct uh, a theoretical framework to uh, view story with theory as uh, Spry uh, suggests. 
And a couple of lessons that I learned and, uh, and I'm just, you know, uh, reflecting here, next time I use critical autoethnographic narrative, what, I, what would I do, what I will do? Uh, I will certainly introduce teacher candidates to methodological literature on autoethnography. I didn't do that much. I did it slightly. I mean, uh, as a teacher educated in general, I'm, I'm not so prescriptive, but at that point, I think I needed to be a little prescriptive. I needed to give them more guidance in terms of the steps of writing an autoethnography, which I didn't do much the first time I, I used uh, CAN in my class. And the next time I will definitely do that, give them more guidance and, and more uh, 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 prescriptive uh, steps to uh, work. And then Cheng's work is really uh, interesting and very uh, solid work on autoethnography. And perhaps I, I will try using collaborative critical autoethnography, grouping students, uh, like two or three of them, uh, and have them work collaboratively to, to write uh, an autoethnography because collaborative autoethnography is its own uh, methodological affordances as people, uh, the autoethnographers, as, as they write their stories and talk about their stories and discuss those stories with their peers, that dialogic uh, conversation uh, is very rich, I believe. So perhaps I can try that next time. And uh, I was going to do that. That was my main focus. But again, I was, you know, too ambitious, perhaps. I was hoping to write my own can as my students were working on their own. Uh, I, I couldn't during the time of the course, but I did later on that summer. Uh, but next time I use it, I will write another uh, critical autoethnography uh, of myself, uh, in perhaps individually or collaboratively with my students. Uh, and uh, I actually did that with uh, Kristen next time I use it in uh, fall 2019, collaborated with her, but next time I use it, I, I still uh, want to collaborate with a colleague to enrich the reflective pra practice as a teacher educator. And uh, the other aspect that I, uh, you know, I would add to my implementation is conduct more in-class analysis exercises. I did two of them in my class in 2018 spring, but I would do more. Uh, of those analyses, uh, practicing with teacher candidates uh, to understand how we can uh, see ideologies and identities in data. Perhaps, you know, recently I was thinking maybe language textbooks could be good uh, for that purpose to analyze ideologies uh, because, you know, textbooks are ideological artifacts and political too. And uh, I didn't do peer feedback. And I, I think next time I use CAN, I will try some peer feedback, especially if the, teach, if the group of uh, language teacher candidates is, is large, that would work really well. Uh, but I could just maybe use a combination of me giving feedback and they uh, provide each other feedback. Uh, again, Kristen tried that in her class and I think it worked really well. Uh, then the, the last thing I will do uh, is invite former students as guest speakers or use their can as samples. That would really help my current students to see that, you know, my past students, they successfully wrote one and they can just share their experiences, perhaps challenges and benefits uh, with my current students. Uh, I think that's pretty much it that I could share with you today. But if you uh, got any questions, I would be more than happy. Thank you so much, guys, for, for coming uh, to our webinar today. I believe we have some time for questions and comments. We would really uh, appreciate. Yes, thank you, Dr. Yazan and Dr. Lindell. Um, we're going to start the Q&A session now. Paulina Vinogradova is going to moderate the Q&A. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, we have quite a few questions and keep them coming, please. Um, I'll just start from the very beginning. Um, Karen Dansky asked you, uh, first of all, she said that she loved all these ideas for the teacher ed classroom. And where can we find more about um, these ideas and these approaches and also, um, talking about the autoethnographies that teacher candidates produced, did you accept multimodalities for the autoethnographies? Oh, sure. I can um, speak to the first part of Karen's question. Thanks so much. Um, the three tasks that I mentioned, uh, we actually compiled um, from some other studies or uh, presentations that we thought, oh, wow, that is a great activity. So um, I think we reference um, 
Coffee 2015 for the linguistic repertoires via the language portraits that I mentioned. Uh, the second task that where um, participants were analyzing student utterances and we were looking at how they positioned um, their students in terms of um, ideology and awareness is actually a task that I piloted in two articles. And um, I can send you the link to that if you want to email either of us. Um, we can share those materials directly. And then the third task on the language ideology tree um, actually saw uh, Tracy Kwan, who is a researcher out of the University of Delaware, I believe. She presented it at the Conference for Language Teacher Educators in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I believe she also published it in 2019. So I can share those um, with you. And then I'll let Dr. Gizan talk about multimodality in uh, critical autoethnography. Thank you for the questions. I, uh, yes, I allowed students and it made it, uh, I actually encouraged them to use multimodalities. Uh, on top of my mind, the first time I used it, uh, two students specifically engaged in incorporating their uh, uh, pictures. One of them uh, found uh, a drawing she did uh, in elementary school and she incorporated that, which was about her national identity, like how her, uh, she was originally from Ukraine and how her Ukrainian identity and U.S. American identity were uh, like, uh, you know, intersecting. Uh, that was an interesting, you know, drawing that I can remember right now. And I, uh, the other thing that I allowed them to do, like uh, other than multimodalities, they, they, I mean, they were really uh, encouraged to include any kind of drawings and arts uh, they uh, would like. And I, I just told them that uh, multiple times, but one other thing that you know, some of them did, they included some uh, some poetry in their uh, in their autoethnography. That was also that was also great. And uh, one other student uh, did a lot of translanguaging and incorporated uh, other languages in uh, their autoethnography as well, other than English. I hope I'm answering okay. the question, but you know, I can definitely clarify if there is any uh, further questions. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is also for you, Bedritin, uh, from uh, Vesna Dimitreska is asking you, how did you deal with the issue of subjectivity considering your double role as a teacher education and researcher? And you talked about this, maybe you could um, kind of talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, that, that's, thank you very much for the question. Again, you know, that's, that's very, um, I don't want to say tricky because you know you know subjectivity is uh, something that I already accepted in that uh, like pedagogical implementation and uh, research that I am uh, doing with that uh, that activity because I I accepted at the very beginning saying that here are my identities which are dominant and you know prominent in that project uh, and I'm still grappling with that you know like how you know my teacher educator identity and my researcher identity are interrelating and interacting the, the, in the interplay maybe between the two and tension. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, that tension is specifically disruptive, but it's very productive to me. Like it's just leading me to explore other activities and to be more innovative to, in my endeavor to try uh, to be consistent between two identities. But subjectivity is always, a, I mean, it's, it's a great, you know, point. Uh, it's always, an an aspect of this activity that I am going to keep reflecting on. It's going to be my source of reflection. So who am I? What am I in this you know, activity? How am I helping my students? Especially like uh, in, I, I wrote this chapter recently and in that chapter, I looked at my feedback sessions with one of my uh, teacher candidates. Like how did I give feedback? Who was I in those feedback sessions? Like, uh, and I, I realized that I, I was, you know, I was playing the role of autoethnography coach and then I was, sometimes I was just suggesting that my students should go ahead and publish their work. And I was just being more of a researcher, uh, mentor. And at, at other points, I was trying to help them see the relationship between their identities and their practices. So then I, I see myself more of a teacher educator. So I think I was, you know, my subjectivity was more of a multi-vocal self, I would say. Uh, I hope I'm answering the question, but I, I can, you know, happily uh, expand more. Okay, thank you. 
our next question. I think that we all related so much to the critical autoethnography topic that there are a lot of questions that are coming um, up on this topic. So the next one is from Jairo Castaneda asking, um, again, Bedritin you, how could you have your students connect the critical with the autoethnographies? Fantastic question, really. That's another challenge of mine I had because I was so like autoethnography as a methodology, depending, I'm not going to get into that conversation because it could just lead to uh, a very lengthy uh, discussion. But like in essence, autoethnography, depending on who you are reading, autoethnography is supposed to be critical, right? But then there is this strand of research which is uh, like naming the autoethnography is critical per se and specifically critical. So the, the challenge that I had was uh, how can I make it critical when it comes to a teacher learning tool? And my uh, like justification to myself and to my students was the way uh, they understand the broader uh, ideologies work in uh, shaping their teaching context, shaping their, you know, even their teaching, shaping their textbooks, shaping whatever they're learning in a teacher education program. I wanted to highlight the, uh, the, the focus of ideology and how ideologies and identities are intersecting. That, that way I wanted to create this critical aspect. And also I was you know, uh, thinking that you know, every um, effort for education is political, especially in our neoliberal uh, economy that you know, uh, like ideologies all are you know, shaping the way we teach, the way we educate our uh, you know, next generation. So understanding education as political and ideological I think that was the, the critical point. Uh, and also me critically reflecting on my own ideologies because the fact that I included critical autoethnography in my teaching or teacher education purposes was also ideological because I value critical autoethnography as a teacher learning tool. So it was a you know, two way or maybe you know, ideological and critical in different, uh, in different senses. Uh, Again, I hope I'm answering your question, but yeah, criticality was certainly focused on understanding uh, ideologies like the macro level and the meso level ideologies and how we grapple with them as we negotiate who we are as, uh, as professionals. Yes, thank you. And the next question actually very nicely kind of follows up on this and dives more into language development from Lazgin Barani. The question is, how can teachers or students identity contribute to developing learners foreign language acquisition? Another great question, really. Uh, so that uh, interaction, I think Janelle Reeves uh, has research on that and Sue Mota as well, like how teachers' identities interact with students' identities and students' uh, language learning. I think uh, my response would be for teacher candidates to understand the relationship to begin with, the relationship between uh, their identities and their practices and their language, their uh, teacher learning. So I think uh, those three components like language, uh, teacher learning, uh, identity development and uh, teaching practices, teacher candidates understanding the relationship between the three would help them understand how their learners or the learners they're working with their students are also grappling with the same uh, identity negotiation because in when it comes to language learning uh, so we can see the same uh, like interrelationship how language learning identity negotiation and actual language use are all interconnected whenever we use the language we negotiate our identities right so and whenever we learn a language then we also uh, can see our identity uh, shaping our learning practices or where we are investing, where we are committing our energies to. I think, uh, I think it's, it's maybe, you know, we can expand it to three levels. At the teacher education level, teacher educators, us should understand how our identities and practices are uh, like in symbiosis, they're shaping each other, they're in a complex related and teacher candidates at the, at the second level, they are also uh, supposed to understand that, that relationship between identity and practice and learning, which would help them understand how they, their, their students uh, are grappling with identities and ideologies as they learn uh, a new language in a context. 
Thank you. I think, yeah, this definitely highlights the complexity and kind of multi-layeredness of this topic and interconnections between identity and language development. And there's another, um, I'm going to jump to, to a, another question that comes a little bit later, but very much related is the um, participant, um, okay, um, Maniram Sharma is asking you about uh, promoting of language awareness in a multilingual context and how um, kind of a teacher, in, an ESL teacher, can, an English teacher can do that as well. I think I'm going to let Kristen answer this. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the question. And um, with regard to um, promoting language awareness in multilingual contexts, uh, actually, those are often ideal contexts to promote multi, uh, multilingual language awareness. So um, there are lots of different ways. I think first, it has a lot to do with sort of what Beth Benton was just talking to us about, kind of the embodiment of identity and in um, sort of seeing language as like an object to be studied. And I sort of uh, coach my teachers as well as my, um, you know, bilingual students on looking at language as more of a verb than a noun. So it, languaging is more of an act or we develop identities as language users um, rather than, you know, just studying this sort of object that's removed from personal experience um, or social uh, situatedness or context, right? And so I think some of the things you can do in um, a multilingual, like a language class, if you are the English teacher, are um, number one things uh, or activities that encourage um, the use of different languages that really encourage students to recognize the strategic ways in which they might be drawing on their own linguistic repertoire, whether they speak multiple um, sort of languages or multiple varieties of a language and really help students be aware of the, the ways they use language and the reasons for which they use language and also, uh, the, the same thing would apply to you as a teacher to model those types of things. I also think classrooms that um, provide space for multiple languages to be seen and connections to be drawn between English and other languages or Englishes and different varieties of English are really important to increasing uh, language awareness so students aren't just learning like, you know, facts or items of English or about English in isolation, but they're seeing the connectedness among uh, English and maybe the languages that they speak or the varieties that they know. So there are a lot of different activities um, that can be done. I think especially with online, um, you know, resources or peer activities, but in, I think encouraging this notion of, um, you know, multiple languages in use in a context is a lot more accurate to how our lives actually are than language separation, which looks at one language over here and another language over here. So I think the short answer to that question is enabling your students to make connections between and among languages and language varieties, uh, one of which, of course, if you're teaching English, is English. So answer to that. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions. There are a number of kind of questions asking uh, Bedrutin, for example, have you written your own critical autoethnography? What type of questions can be used to scaffold teacher candidates? And I, I really want to acknowledge these questions, but since we have just two minutes left, I would like there are two overlapping questions um, that I think both uh, Kristen and Bedrutin can speak to. They seem to be kind of like robust questions. So. I would like to pose those uh, together. There's a question, uh, both of these questions have to do with power and issues of inequality and how when we talk about identity negotiation and identity positioning, we deal with issues of power and inequality. So um, Hara Castaneda is asking a question, um, how would you deal with power issues in case you want to do some collaborative autoethnography with your students. And there is a question that very much overlapped that comes from uh, Albert Peel saying that identity research often looks at inequalities. Can this research be carried out by me? Uh, in quotation marks, a privileged white male, or is it not my place? So how can, would you, um, our experts on identity negotiation, its complexities, how would you respond to um, these um, nuances, these questions? 
Well, Polina, I think I'm going to, I'm going to speak to the, the very last question because it reminded me of uh, one of my students, uh, I don't want to call resistance, but you know, maybe like uh, uncertainty about critical autoethnography at the very beginning of semester. The, the, the second time I used critical autoethnography in my class, I had three students and we had a lot of conversation. We, I mean, I had a lot of time to work with them. Uh, like one student specifically, she was uh, taking her time to start and she was, you know, she kept asking me questions uh, very similar to the last question you mentioned, like, uh, like, Critical autoethnography is that a methodology uh, which could be used by uh, the populations or minoritized, marginalized populations only? I think that the answer to that is is no. Uh, I mean, critical autoethnography or autoethnography in general provides the space, discursively and experientially, the space for researchers and practitioners to. Uh, discuss the power and equality or ideologies in a context or different contexts or cultures. Uh, but it's, I mean, but it also uh, is a methodology that anybody can use, uh, regardless the, uh, the privileges, anybody or any researcher practitioner can use autoethnography to discuss those inequalities from their own perspective. Uh, I think, uh, I, I don't think critical autoethnography is uh, delimited to the, uh, you know, populations who are minoritized and marginalized uh, in cultures. Uh, I, and th that, at least that's how I convinced my student to keep writing, uh, and she did, and she, she kept writing about, uh, and she, she took those experiences uh, from her past and how she was working with, uh, uh, she was interested in uh, language enclaves in New York and later on in, in the South. But, you know, she, she used her experiences there to highlight how, uh, like the other question mentioned, like how power and inequality is uh, function or operate through, that, through ideologies and discourses in our communities. Uh, I think I'm going to let Kristen to, to take another uh, stab on the other questions, but I can just uh, happily talk more. No, I think, um, I don't know if there's much we can add. Um, I think you, you said that very well about, you know, the, the actual, I think, rationale or impetus for identity approaches, uh, especially to language teacher education, are that they, um, you know, don't impose any kind of top-down sort of theoretical or conceptual framework on what people are experiencing, enacting, negotiating as they, um, you know, participate in the different communities in which they are members. And um, and so I think as Dr. Yazan mentioned, like the beauty of identity oriented research is that it provides space um, for, for multiple voices and um, multiple experiences, multiple worldviews, and um, of course, you know, multiple perspectives on language and, and how it's um, developed in, in a lot of different contexts. So although the two of us are are currently US based, you know, we certainly see this as an opportunity for um, TESOL professionals, regardless of context to, you know, it's a really interesting challenge to take some of this and apply it in your own context and, um, and see what your findings are. And I think one thing we have really benefited from in our own experience has a lot to do with our own reflective practices as teacher, educator, educators, and that layer that exists that, you know, it's not just teachers who need to examine their identity related to how they enact um, that I those identities with their students. And it's not just teacher educators who need to, but it's also teacher educator educators because, um, you know, some of you might be working with doctoral students who will go on to become teacher educators. Um, and then some of you might be working directly with teachers as a teacher educator. And then those of you who are um, in the classroom, right, it, it applies to, to all of us. So I think I would maybe just end on that note um, since due to time constraints. And also for those of you, if there was a question in the chat that we didn't get to, but you would still like to ask us, please feel free to email. And um, we are more than happy to continue to engage with you about this topic. 
Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we have to conclude, and there are a number of other questions that deal, again, with relationships of power, with complexities, with um, kind of not native, non-native English speaker dynamics. And I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize that we won't be able to answer them right now. But as our presenters said, please um, email them and uh, continue this conversation. Um, we are also happy to say that our series of webinars focused on TESOL teacher identity development continues and there will be another webinar coming in October, so please uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was fantastic to see you all. Thank you so much for our presenters on this very insightful, very interesting um, presentation conversation clearly the amount of comments and the amount of questions indicates how important and timely this topic is we had almost 120 participants today which is from all over the world people who also didn't <laughs> sleep at night uh, who had, for whom it's 10 p.m. and midnight and later in the night who joined us thank you all so much and have a fantastic weekend and we hope to see you soon in our future webinars Thank you.